Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome everyone at this webinar. Um, as everyone jumps on the webinar, um, feel free to let us know who you are and where you're from. It's nice to know who we're talking to. Um, my name's Stacey, and I'm the Social Media and Content Manager here at Relab. And um, I'll just cover some quick webinar admin points before I pass on to Ben for the full introduction. Um, I'll be managing the chat throughout the webinar, so if you've got any technical issues or general questions, um, I can try to help you out. Um, I'll also be monitoring the chat for any questions throughout the webinar um, that I'm will be answered at the end. Um, you will receive a recording at the end of the webinar in your inbox later this evening. Um, it will also be available on our um, Facebook pages and YouTube channel um, tomorrow as well. And um, just a little disclaimer that um, everything discussed in this webinar shouldn't be taken as professional advice. Please make sure you consult a professional before you do make any decisions. And cool, um, that is all from me. I will pass on to Ben. Awesome. Thank you, Stacey. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Subdivision New Zealand webinar development series. Today, I'm very, very happy and excited to um, bring on board Richard um, Richard Ashby from Gilligan Shepherd. He is a tax expert in this space with loads of experience. And obviously, joined with me is uh, my good friend, Kirsty Merriman, also admin of Subdivision New Zealand. She'll be able to explain some of the key scenarios that we're going to go through today. So there will be three, and um, why don't you uh, let the audience know? Yeah, well, thank you very much for that, um, Ben. So what I want to start is we've, we've picked three scenarios that we believe are the most common. Um, we've seen them on the web, uh, on Facebook, and um, also with the connections I've got to many of you on um, Subdivision New Zealand. But what I want to say is when I started off, um, I was swamped with all this vast amount of information and I just want to stress to everyone we cannot overlook specialist advice in particular tax to do with tax and legal to do with contracts uh, many of us try to shortcut that and to go cheap and not get it problem is it will bite you and it will bite you very hard so um is this speaking of experience <laughs> well no it's speaking well it's what i've heard yeah. the amount of people that are, are not doing it and i understand why because mm. you know i was seeking tax advice at the start and it was actually hard to get it at the time because it was right. 2020. so what i found is that getting specialist tax advice actually looked at my particular position um, the advisor looked at the situation I was in, what my intent was, my length of time holding, what the rest was, and gave me personal advice. And specialist tax advice does not constitute a request on Facebook, um, nor does it necessarily constitute a rapid fire um, one hour consult with someone online. Mm. There are things such as GST, tax on gains and profits, how you structure and how you time things. So I made myself as familiar as I could with tax law. Um, what's that big? Um, the technical section of the tax IRD, although I think it's uh, been populated a bit more since. And I also had my new accountants. I changed accountants throughout. Um, he's a general accountant, but he puts our specialist property development tax to a specialist. Now, I'm in Auckland, but uh, my accountant and the specialists are in Dunedin. So you don't need to have your advisors uh, in the same city. So what I can um, say is I stress the importance of a specialist and hence uh, our discussion and um, yep. asking Richard if he would be happy to talk to us and yes. answer our questions. And our coffee last week, having a decent chat yes. and Love pulling together scenarios. So first of all, uh, without holding things up too much, Richard, uh, we gave you the first scenario, and that was what I think is one of the more common infills, and that is where we have one full site. And people are currently living in the only house on the site. Conveniently, it's at the front mm. and it's to the side. Right. So there's a nice three, four meter driveway access perfect on the site. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Everything about it is perfect. Yes. Um, it's neat. It's it's got perfect soil. The next door neighbours have got exactly the same, but their soil isn't perfect. Right. Um, I'm just flagging that, as yes. you know why. Yes. Um, and they've got space to build a 
series of three slim homes um, where they want to rent out for long-term income. Okay. So, Richard, what, what are you going to say um, to these people? Right. Uh, well, the first thing I would say to my clients, um, I basically have a, um, and, and what I'll apply for all three scenarios here, mm -hmm. is I have a, a sort of, I guess, a logical process that I go through in my mind yeah. whenever a client approaches me and says, this is what I want to do with my land. Now, in a scenario like this, the first thing I ask them is, well, what was the land acquisition date? And that's important to me because it then sort of tells me of the various taxing provisions that may apply to them, how many of them can I knock out straight away? Can I tell you that they're fairly recently married, and my terms are three years is fairly recently. Okay. So they acquired it as a wedding present. Okay. So so, um, so straight away, I'm, I'm thinking... Uh, if I go through my logical process, that there is a, a rule called the minor subdivision rule. Mm. And and basically that applies to any person. So myself as an accountant, as a tax advisor, if I own a piece of land and I decide that I want to develop or subdivide that land into lots, yeah. and and I commence that subdivision scheme within the requ requisite time period, which is within 10 years of buying the land, yeah. um, then I potentially have a taxable subdivision. Mm. We refer to this taxing provision of, as section CB12. Mm. Okay. Um, you can find CB12 online quite easily, can't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, just mentioned, yeah, yeah. you just mentioned yeah. the IED website before, and I've got a couple of just tips for, for the audience here about uh, if they like to do their own homework, I'm going to suggest a couple of places they can look at to answer some of these questions. Now, so basically CB12 just looks, there's, there's three main components to it. Have you commenced an undertaking or scheme to mm -hmm. develop or subdivide your land? An important point there is, once you're deemed to have commenced your scheme, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you then abandon it, okay? Commencement potentially triggers the taxing provision. Mm -hmm. So then it's a case of saying, okay, if I have abandoned it, can I show that my scheme was not for the purpose of sale? I would say applying for a resource consent for another reason. But well, I never I intended to. These people want to just rent. Yep. That's, that's their intent. Yep. So, so they. The first thing I'd say is um, uh, to them. Uh, the issue is: Are you going to trigger Section CB12? Mm -hmm. And and the final component there is: Is the work involved in your scheme going to be more than minor in nature? Mm -hmm. Okay. Your question to me is going to be: Well, what does minor mean? Exactly. Now, and I've also flagged that the, the site is perfect. Right. Yeah, it, it's yeah. not South the land, it's not, it's not <laughs> city land, yep. it's not only hunger land. It's flat. <laughs> okay. It, it, it's the soil. Oh, well, until until August 2020, it was a bit of a guess in terms of looking at the various cases that have gone through the courts in the in the past, in terms of what did that, that minor terminology actually mean. And then in uh, August 2020, the IRD Put out a, an interpretation statement, IS 2008. Mm. So, first place you can go to do some homework is if you're doing a subdivision within 10 years of buying your land, yep. go and have a look at IS 2008 because it talks about what is the meaning of minor. Mm. Now, within that interpretation statement, there's a couple of cost thresholds. Now, if your absolute cost to do your subdivision, excluding reserve contribution fees and resource consent application mm. fees, mm -hmm. If the remaining cost and excluding the build work, sorry, you're putting dwellings on top. Mm -hmm. So if your absolute costs are more than fifty thousand yep. dollars, then you're not going to tick that box. Under fifty thousand, you take yeah, one yeah, box. It's likely to be more than fifty because we have to put a driveway down, we have to take drainage down, and we have to get more water down. Or five percent. Yeah. Yeah. Or the other. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Or the or the second uh, um, cost measure is your absolute costs. Mm -hmm. How are they relative to the value of your land when you commence your scheme? If the absolute cost to relative value of the land at the commencement of the scheme is less than 5%, then you'll tick another box. Now, if you tick both those boxes, you can be fairly confident that your work is not going to be considered more than minor, and therefore you won't trigger Section CB12. Yeah. Now, there are a couple of things IRD says in this interpretation statement about if the, if the character of the land is significantly changed, if the legal works or the professional services work is quite quite complex, mm. then regardless of you satisfying those cost thresholds, they might still think it's exceeded the minor work. Mm. Okay, 
but ticking those two boxes is a good start. Um, now, if there is a taxable subdivision in place, mm -hmm. so they've exceeded the 50k, yes. and the, the work's going to be more than minor in nature, mm -hmm. the next step I move on to is the legislative exclusions. Is there an exclusion from section CB12 mm -hmm. that they may be able to claim? Now, there's four exclusions. Now, in this case, two of them, which is the business premises exclusion and the farmland exclusion, it doesn't apply. clearly not going to apply. Doesn't apply yeah. Okay. So the next question to my client will be, who owns the land? And whose name is the land? Is it owned personally? Oh, it's a family jointly? trust. Is it in a family trust? It's in a family trust. Oh, so, <laughs> yes, well, unfortunately, oh no, because of the other mm -hmm. two remaining legislative exclusions, the main one is the residential land exclusion, mm -hmm. which basically says if you have lived on the land before you commence the subdivision, and it's less than 4,500 square metres, then you can claim the residential exclusion. Mm -hmm. The carve out is that exclusion does not apply where a trust owns the land. And I've had a number of clients caught out because they've come to me, I've asked them who owns the land, I've set a trust, I've said, well, sorry, at the moment, this legislative exclusion does not apply to you. Mm -hmm. Now, that's quite out of sync with another residential exclusion in the land tax provisions, which does permit a trust to own the land and you can claim the residential exclusion. So there's a legislative mis mismatch there, oh, okay. but no real motivation by the government at the moment to change it. We've got too many tax. other things yeah. on there. And there's on the more, they'll lose tax and profit. Yeah. So so um, if if you tell me that uh, it's owned by an individual, yeah. then I'll say, okay, how big is the land? Because again, if it's less than four and a half thousand square yeah. meters, yeah. you're on your way to being able to claim this residential exclusion. Mm. Okay. Um, if it's the the remaining exclusion is what we call the investment land exclusion. Okay. So if you are doing the subdivision for the purpose of deriving rental income from the completed lots, mm -hmm. which you are in this case, and that's the full intention. Yep. Then you're likely to be able to, to claim the investment income exclusion. So section CB12 will not apply to you. But it doesn't end there, unfortunately. Mm. That's just one taxing provision. The next one we need to consider is tainting. Mm. When you bought this piece of land, were you associated with any person in the business of land dealing or in developing or subdividing land? If you are, then there's a 10 year tainting period. Mm. So even though you have nothing to do with those businesses, if you're associated and there's a legislative associated persons definition, yeah. which will, you can work out if you're associated or not, you also need to be aware of tainting issues. So that's mm. the next thing I'll ask my clients. And they'll say, no, I know nobody. Absolutely, that. no one, they know no one. And then we get to, I guess, what's always on the tip of people's tongues these days, um, the right line rule. Yeah. So you notice I didn't talk about it at the top. Okay. Because in the legislative picking order, it doesn't actually come in until you've considered all those other tax and provisions. Yeah. But as most of us know, if you buy land within the right line period, so since October 2015, when it first came in, it's gone from two years to five years and now to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you sell within the bright line period, the bright line period usually commencing when the title of land is transferred to you and ending when you enter into a binding contract to sell your land. Mm -hmm. So if that period is shorter than your relevant bright line period, then you have a bright line tax issue. And there's very few exclusions from bright line. Mm -hmm. Okay, the main home exclusion, there's two types now, depending on when you acquired your land, because mm -hmm. they've got the pre-27th of March 2021 rules mm -hmm. and the new post-27th of March 21 rules. Yeah. Um, but other than that, unless it's uh, transferred to you by way of relationship agreement or it's upon death of, of somebody close to you, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying bright line tax, even if you can get around all these other exclusions. Yeah, we, we don't have any inheritance mm -hmm. tax here. And even if you get past... Uh, yeah, and even if you get past Brightline, mm. the final consideration yep. for this scenario is has there been a change in use in the land use rights for your section? Mm. You know, when you bought that land, could you do your, your, your four lot subdivision you're going to be doing now? No. Or has there been a change in the unitary plan the that's enabled to do, you, to do that? Now, if yep. that's the case, then it's likely another section called CB14 may come in and get you at the end. Yeah. The good thing about section CB14 is it actually has a discount. 
Mm. So for every year that you've owned the land, yeah. you get a 10% discount off the amount of your profit that may be subject to tax. Okay. Okay. So the basic rule you need to work out is, am I selling within 10 years? Yeah. Because this, this tax and provision is triggered by the date you sell. Yeah. If you're selling within 10 years, does more than 20% of your disposal gain mm -hmm. relate to the land use change? So you're gonna to need to get a value oil involved to work, nice. this, to work this out. Mm -hmm. If it does, then your whole gain is taxable, mm -hmm. but then subject to the discount, okay? Yeah. So okay. 10 years, can so that in, be 10% in per year? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yes. So in short, just interested in, in sticking to our time, um, <laughs> we, we have a, they've only had it for a short while. Yes. You've very clearly given, uh, you know, thought points running down. And um, because it's owned in a trust, they may fit within the, um, still not have to pay tax on profit uh, because that's not their intention. They are doing it for long-term investment yeah. and they're not tainted. So yes. Great. Yeah, I think I think you know as long as you covered off those, they still have to be aware of the relevant bright line period. Yep. Now they're sticking yep. new builds, what we refer to as new builds on the land. So at least it'll be a. Um, a actually, I should should back up a bit on that. When you when you subdivide your land, it doesn't change your bright line period. Okay, your bright line period is always commences with the original lot purchase. Mm -hmm. So if they've owned it for three years, even in year four, if they subdivide that land into three new titles, it does not create a new right line for each of those new titles. So from the, the start, yeah, yep. they are intending long-term hold, they will probably be holding for 15 years. Yep. Things theoretically be fine, but you uh, yep. we would suggest they do need to get specialist tax advice. Well. I, yes, I yes, agree with a lot of those sentiments you made up front. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to move on to the next scenario. Um, so this here is a full site. Um, it's been owned and lived in the house and site for 18 years. Um, and the intent is to build terraced houses on that site. Okay. Um, I think it's eight of them. Okay. That's okay. my intent. It's a nice development. Mm. Hopefully it's pretty. You know, <laughs> it's <laughs> in it. We get it done in time. Okay, so I guess, you know, straight away in my head, you're telling me you've owned the land for 18 years. Yeah. Okay. So immediately, I can carve out, clearly you did not buy this land with intention of sale. In fact, well, it couldn't be divided at all at the time. Yep, yeah. so you couldn't have point. done what you're going to do. Um, you, um, clearly it's not subject to Brightline, where we're assuming it's, we're in real time, so it's yeah. well before October 2015. Uh, clearly you're not going to trigger Section CB12, because mm -hmm. you're commencing your scheme after 10 years, yeah. so you can never trigger C Section CB12. Um, Section CB14 is not going to apply mm -hmm. because it's, even if there's been a land use change, you've still held the land for more than 10 years. So you might be thinking that you're on a winner. There's just one more land taxing provision we need to consider. And that's referred to section as Section CB13. Yeah. Um, now Section CB13 is similar in vain to the way Section CB12 is worded. Mm -hmm. Any person, mm -hmm. so I don't have to be a developer, which clients often say to me, I'm not a developer, so it doesn't apply to me. Mm. Sorry, any there's person. not. Yep, it just talks about any person, and person in the wider sense, company, trust, partnership. Yep. Yeah, I see. Okay. So any person who commences a scheme or undertaking to, to um, develop or um, subdivide their land, um, any time period, but usually because Section CB12 applies first because you just need more than minor expenditure. Mm. CB13 normally comes in after 10 years. And it uses that word significant. Yes. And, it's... and significant was not qualified when I began mine. Ah, right. Yeah. So you had, a, you had a lesson in learning what well, does yes, significant, significant expenditure mean. mean yes. yeah. Well, again, if you go to the space on the IRD's website, the tax technical section, now. and put in the word significant expenditure. Now they have it. Yes. It's going to come up with a, what we call uh, questions we've been asked. QB 1502 mm. and essentially that QB talks about what is the meaning of significant okay now there's a there's a couple of things the IRD says that it includes and a, a few things they say it doesn't include mm. okay so when we're looking at CB 13 the, essentially we're only looking at development work for the land mm. both physical 
and non-physical. So when you're doing assessments around cost and relative value that will come to soon, mm -hmm. similar to section CB12, you can remove uh, costs that are purely divisional, say survey, surveying mm -hmm. or uh, drawing up your, your, your lots, yeah. um, as opposed to surveying for build, um, build or developing the land, earthworks mm -hmm. or something. You can remove those from your equation. Mm -hmm. um, and also, interestingly, and the courts have given this their uh, sign of approval, is you can remove from your equation future expenditure yet to be incurred. So I say to a client, okay, you've got a site that, that adjoins the roadside. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, perhaps do it in stages? Yeah. Can you complete your, your roadside lots first, mm -hmm. dispose of them, and then move on to your next stage? Because what, what the, the revenue has agreed to, and you can read about it here in QB 1502, is it's only when you cross the significant expenditure threshold mm -hmm. that everything after that is taxable. So you may be able to do these first front ones at a lower cost, yeah. because they don't need driveway access and those sorts of things. What, what was the threshold? But there's no monetary threshold in oh, this yeah. regard. It's just looking at what's, what's um, significant. Now, if you read this QB 1502, towards the end, there's three examples given by the revenue to explain mm -hmm. what they mean. And you will see that those three examples will probably not shed any new light for you on what does significant mean. <laughs> and that's because uh, when we talk about what the IOD does consider, there's three components, okay? Again, there's absolute cost. Mm -hmm. What did it actually cost you? And we're talking now, uh, the development costs of both the physical and non-physical nature. Mm -hmm. What did it actually cost you to do your scheme? Okay, right. and you've got to say, is that significant alone on a standalone basis? Now, one of the revenues examples says the absolute cost was two hundred thousand dollars. Now, in my head, that doesn't sound like a lot of money when you're doing a, a subdivision scheme like this or development sure scheme like this. <laughs> <laughs> now, the IRD's view is that that triggers um, section CB13. They believe in anyone's eyes, $200,000 is a significant amount. Therefore, they say it triggers the taxing provision. The other thing they look at is, is now under CB12, you just had to look at uh, the absolute cost versus the pre-commencement uh, value of the land. With CB13, you look at both pre-commencement and post-completion values. Okay, now from everything I've read, and there's a couple of court cases, but they're quite old. Mm -hmm. If you're getting over 10% in any of those relative assessments, you're probably getting into muddy waters. Right. So, so what I'm going to do <laughs> is, um, we've kind of covered significant and see if we can get through yep. the next thing so we can make time for questions. Yeah, okay. So, and the next thing is the intention, you know, so you, to sell. So if you're going to to to, to sell, then um, you know, actually you're going to trigger section CB13. If you're going to hold, then you might be able to to argue the the residential investment income exclusion will apply to you, yeah. even if you've done significant. Um, again, I'm going to ask the who is the owner of the land. Mm. Now I'll ask that because even though you're doing eight units here, because of how we can squeeze things on a section of land these days, yeah. You can still claim the same residential exclusion if your land is less than four and a half thousand square meters. Oh, but okay. it was bought in a company because the intent was to sell. Mm. So I that's the key thing here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, but this one's been open for 18 years, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know. So, oh, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. But their startup was, yeah. so mm. they decided they were building and selling. Okay. So, so in this case, therefore, they won't get the residential exclusion. So then I'll also move on to tainting. Now, the reason I raise tainting here is because of the associated person rules. Mm. There's quite an interesting one that people often overlook. And that's if, if you're associated when you buy the land with, um, sorry, if you're associated when you commence your improvements to the land mm. with a person, person in the wider sense of the word, including companies, yeah. who carries on a business of erecting buildings, then, um, and you commence your, your improvements, when you're associated to that person carrying on their building business, from the date that you end your improvements, so you complete your project, you have to then hold the land for 10 years, otherwise you're taxed by association. Okay? 
people don't think of this because they think of how they land for 18 years. But this curious rule can basically yeah. restart the 10 year clock really based important. on improvements. Yep. Yeah. So it's when so they've they finished their development, out. they've got another 10 years to hold. If they've got that builders association. But as we mm. said, for this scenario, we're trying to reflect what's mm. common out there. And yep. that was, so it's probably an unusual. Yep. Most they people say to me they don't, they don't have this association to build it, so we can just we can just clear that. Now, having covered off all the land tax provisions, mm -hmm. you might think you're home free. Yeah. <laughs> what I've seen recently, though, is there's this, this, this section in the Act called Section CB3, mm -hmm. and all it's titled is Profit Making Undertaking or Scheme. And I've seen the revenue, I have a live case at the moment that's going to adjudication, mm -hmm. where they've tried to get me on all the other angles, mm -hmm. and they can't, but the one they're coming at me on is that my client commenced the subdivision scheme, and it's a profit making undertaking or scheme, therefore section CB3 applies. There's not a lot of law around it in respect of land. Mm. Um, a lot of commentators say, well, if you've got the land tax provisions, and you can satisfy all those and not be taxed, why should you be taxed under this profit making undertaking or scheme provision? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the courts have thrown that out and say, well, it doesn't say that we, the we can't, can't yeah. apply this. Yep. So they'll rely on it if they can, as they are. Um, <laughs> like but it does look at your dominant purpose. Yeah. So um, as opposed to an incidental purpose to make a profit, your dominant purpose must be to make a profit. Mm -hmm. If you're ticking that box, then you may have a section CB3 issue, even though you've got around everything else. And there's no time limit. So again, you've owned the land for 18 years, it can still apply. The final one that I'm going to talk about here, and it's surprising how many people overlook it, is GST. Yes, yes. People just think, I'm not in the business of development, yeah. um, I might consider my income tax issues, mm -hmm. but so many people don't think about GST. And it's not until someone maybe, actually I had a recent case where it was uh, the architect on site. Mm. Just mentioned to my who became my client because then he knew he was in trouble. Yeah, and he said to him, "What about the GST on this side of things?" And my client said to him, "Well, no, I'm not a I'm not a developer." <laughs> yeah. but if you look at the definition of a taxable activity for GST, which then triggers a requirement to register for GST if you're going to exceed the taxable supplies, a taxable activity is simply any person is looking to supply goods or services mm -hmm. to another person. For a, con for a consideration mm -hmm. on a continuous or regular basis. Mm -hmm. Now most of that's pretty black and white. And you'd say, if what you're doing here is basically you've owned the land for 18 years, yeah. you're doing an eight lot development, and that's you plan to sell. Yeah. Yeah? So you say, I'm gonna be making a supply of goods yeah. to another person for a consideration. The issue here is, what is what you're doing either continuous or regular? Yeah. Now both the court and IRD have said, if it's a one-off project, it can't be regular. Because mm -hmm. regular normally means you know, a number of yeah, yep, yeah, got yeah, multiple yeah. sites and projects yeah, yeah. going on. Yeah. Now, when it comes to continuous, which is from a subdivision perspective, is when people normally get caught out. The more lots that you create in your subdivision, and the more work you do on those lots, mm. so say, you sell them all at once. say BLN versus selling mm. developed lots, mm the more likely you're going to be deemed to be carrying on a continuous activity and therefore GST will apply. But for the backyard developer or the small infill um, as a result mm. of the, um, the unitary plan changes, they're building eight lots, they're all sold, pre-sold, and they're all settling on the same day. That's not continuous? I can tell you now that the same <laughs> case that I've got going to adjudication where they're trying to get me on section CB3, yeah. This involved a, 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 an elderly lady who yeah. was looking after her family and she subdivided her lot from one lot into two. Mm -hmm. They erected a dwelling on the front lot, they lived in the back lot. They sold the front lot, IOD came knocking on their door. Wow. Now this is how we've been, you know, we could say personal residence exclusion because she owned in her own name, yeah. less than four and a half thousand square metres. Mm -hmm. So the IOD didn't like it, but they've had to stick with that. It's not right on because it's pre-2015. Mm -hmm. So they're going for profit making intentional scheme, but the other thing they're going for, interestingly, is GST. They consider that the mere fact, if, if they, they said to me that if, if the taxpayer here had just carved off the front section and sold a beer land lot, mm -hmm. they would have been okay. The fact she went the next step 
and she erected a dwelling on that lot, um, moves it into the tax activity for GST. Now there's no support for this, yeah. but with the revenue, of course, it's who's got the deepest pockets, mm. and that's why a uh, like client at this time is going to adjudication, mm. and we're hoping this adjudication, which is like an independent review of the ID's case, yeah. they'll come back and say, no, there's no GST payable here. Now, I'm a bit suspicious about the IRD's GST position here because when we were trying to negotiate the dispute, they offered to me that if you agree to the income tax position, yeah, we would withdraw yeah. the GST issue, which suggests to me that maybe they don't think their case is so strong. But based on my experience, what you've said about even if you sold everything at once, if you're doing an eight lot subdivision, because that's effectively what you're doing, nine times out of 10, the revenue is gonna to say to you, that's just terrible. Yeah. So that <laughs> sounds like... Which is disputable, yeah, you can argue. Yeah, but the other comment I would have is, uh, it seems to be that uh, support for trying to build new homes and um, make it uh, incentivize yeah. dividing mm -hmm. up your backyard is um, is not really there from the IRS. Well, they do, give you, so, they do give, give you an incentive in terms of bright line, you only have a yeah. five year period instead of a 10 year yes. period if you construct <laughs> new builds on your own. Yeah. But they don't care. It's not about fairness. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So anyway, to wrap up this one, it seems like um, there are several steps as well. And again, having specialist tax advice and being very clear on GST and also mm -hmm. having hat on understanding that not everyone in the tax department is going to be encouraging mm -hmm. uh, you to divide up your backyard. Yes, you've got so, some, some very interesting characters of the IAD. And, and the risk you need to that, take yeah. to do that, yes. um, especially through probably the past couple of years and maybe the next two years going. You have to think very carefully about um, what you're going to make out of it, if anything, or long-term investment. So now I'm going to move on to scenario three to try and keep this tight which is um, slightly different. Yes. And that is <laughs> recently, yeah, it's, it's a complicated <laughs> one for you. Uh, so I'll try and keep it tight if we can. It'll probably cover a lot of the bits mm. that we have discussed. So very recently I purchased a large site, which well, not me, but this yes. is, many yeah. people have done this. Um, and I've decided to build a block of two units. So one block will be sold and the second block will be held to rent out for the long-term income. So in my mind, I'm thinking, if I sell the first block, uh, that's going to kind of pay uh, my debt down yep. to allow me to more comfortably yep. generate a family that. cash flow long term. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm not quite sure the balance of everything, but this is where my mind's sitting at the moment. So I've come in to see you, and you know, I've come in early on. Because I know that's a good start. Yes. So you've got me on key dogs. Yeah, yeah, early. Yeah, absolutely. Early. Yes. Yes. Early. That's right. That is right. So you're going to run through um, this scenario. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, and I, I have certainly had these these uh, these scenarios put to me. Mm -hmm. um, and just stepping back a little bit, just one thing I'd ask is, you know, what was your acquisition intention? Now I know you've said here yeah, there's a there's a hold in a in a cell. Yes. Um, but I, uh, but I wanted to become very clear to my client that if, if on the date they signed the binding agreement to buy the land, they actually intended to develop and sell everything, no. then um, you can't change that intention. You've triggered, triggered what we call Section CB6, which mm -hmm. is intention of resale. The land is in taxable whenever you sell it. Okay, so just be mindful. Um, a couple of things that the onus of proof is always on you, mm. not on the IRD. Interestingly, they brought in the bright line test to uh, to cover the ex existing intention of resale test because the commissioner found it too hard to challenge people's intentions, even though mm. the onus of proof was on the taxpayer, not on the commissioner. Yeah. Um, the other thing to be very mindful of is what you tell other parties before you're buying the land. If you're going to your bank and saying, yep, lend me $3 million, your security is safe because all I'm going to do is develop this and sell it straight away, that more than likely they're going to note that on your customer file. It's discoverable by the IAD. When you're later on trying to say to the IAD, no, 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 my intention was to build some and to hold some. Mm -hmm. Okay, so be very careful about what you tell other people. Now, in your case, you've said, you know, I had a clear intent yeah. you know, when I bought this land to hold some and to 
the, the for long term cash flow investment. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So so again, because we've moved on from intention, the next thing is we're back into into in this case looking at section C B twelve, because that's basically the next, you know, the minor subdivision rules. Mm -hmm. Arguably here you'd say that, um, well, I'm gonna trigger that. I'm gonna commence my scheme within ten years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clearly the work involved is gonna be more than minor in nature. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm going to hold some, and I'm going to sell some. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so because the, the section CB12 looks at are you doing the subdiv subdivision for the purpose of selling the land, mm -hmm. or for some other purpose? Mm -hmm. So you might have to pay tax on some of the land, but you may be able to claim the residential investment income exclusion for the remainder mm -hmm. land. Yeah. Okay, but, but you, if you made no profit on your first block. You'd have to be careful with your profit allocations, of course, because yeah. the revenue is going to be thinking. They, they will look into it. They've always got the benefit of hindsight, so they're going to look into it. Mm. Um, now, I talk here about what we call a non legislative exclusion, okay? Because you might say, uh, what I'm doing, there's no legislative exclusion for it. Um, but, for example, I bought land with the intention of resale, but I didn't intend to sell at all. I bought land with the intention of doing a, a subdivision to sell mm -hmm. some of the land, but I didn't intend to sell it all. Mm -hmm. So questions being asked to the IRD, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know down the document number for this, um, but what if a legislative exclusion doesn't apply to me, can I still have my subsequent disposals of say the rental properties mm -hmm. exempt from tax? And the revenues come back with saying yes, but the onus is on the taxpayer to, to show mm -hmm. that those lots that were retained, so in your case, there's a block of units retained to drive investment income, that that was your intention when you did that, okay? And again, they always have the benefit of hindsight. So mm -hmm. I'm always telling my clients, you know, it's nice that we can, in this case, we should be able to re rely on the, on the residential investment income exclusion for those lots you're gonna hold. Mm -hmm. But what if the IRD challenges that? You know, is there some other way we can also show to them that you never intended to sell those lands, that land, mm -hmm. and then go down the non-legislative path of trying to claim, okay? I see. Now, if you can get around section CB12, section CB6 intentional resale, you can get around section CB12, then of course, you've got <laughs> you've got good old bright lines yes, in there, yes. you know? So you've just bought your land and, uh, and you're gonna hold some, you have to remember, of course, it's still subject to the bright line period for those retained units. Yes. Now you're putting uh, new builds, obviously, mm -hmm. so at least it's going to be a five year test instead of a 10 and not a 10 year test. Yeah. Okay, but you need to keep that in mind. Um, and of course, your general retained thing as well. If you sell any of those retained units in a 10 year period and you have associations with developers, dealers, builders, subdividers, you may have a tainting issue that can also catch you up. Okay. I said, don't marry a builder or a builder. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we got the, the whole land use change as well that we talked about before. You know, it comes along at the end, just before section CB13, but it jumps in there and says, you know, this thing that you're doing now, now you've just bought the land, mm -hmm. so it's probably not applicable in your situation. Mm -hmm. But for someone who's had their the land a little while, has there been a land use change that now permits you to to do like um, an entry plan. Yep. Yeah. Some change under the Resource Management Act or mm -hmm. environmental um, court ruling or something like that that now permits you to do something you couldn't do Before. when you bought the land. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you're selling within 10 years, then you need to, these retain lots, then you need to consider the application of section CB14 as well. You know, and, uh, when I sell those retained units, is more than 20% of my gain as a result of that land use change. If it is, I've got a potential taxing issue under section CB14. There is an exclusion, but we won't go into that here. Um, and uh, if I am taxed, then of course I get a discount for every year that I've held on to those retained. Now, of course, you would have had to hold on to them for at least five years yes. to circumvent bright line. And what was that discount? And that, that discount's the same. It's 10% it's, it's it's for like every whole yeah. year. Yeah. So it's not calendar year, it's not uh, income year, it's just looking at the date of purchase. Oh, okay. So just your anniversary date. Yeah. How many anniversary dates do you have since you acquired your land? 
and that ten percent each time gets you a discount. Wow. So if you had it nine years, you only pay tax on ten percent of your gain. Okay. Um, and of course, we also have GST issues. We touched on but this one's a lot more difficult because you've got some of the land that you're looking at selling. Yeah. So clearly, that in itself may create a taxable activity for you. Yeah. Because you're going to trigger all those basic principles, and and the more lots you create, you'll be doing continuously. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have some land that you are developing for the purpose of deriving exempt supplies from, because residential rent is an exempt supply for GST purposes. Yeah. Now, what you need to be careful, and depending on who you bought the land off, for example, if you're making a secondary goods claim, and you want to have this argument that I did some to hold and some to sell, then you want to make sure when you make your claims, they are a portion of you know you're making a portion claims fairly. Mm -hmm. You know you're only claiming for GST purposes those costs that relate to the GST taxable side of things and not to the exempt side of things. Okay. Right, so that's um, quite complex, really. Yes, that and one does get quite complex when it comes to the GST it? issues. And the yes. main thing I've learned out of all of this is I will steer clear of relationships with any builders or <laughs> yeah. anyone how do you, that could How do you define the associated person anyway? It's, it is, I mean, it's legislatively defined. Yeah. Now, the general associated person rules, which apply for most of the Income Tax Act, is very wide. It's very hard to get around. Um, in terms of anybody that's sort of closely related, I mean, obviously friends and that you can get around with. And <laughs> Sign <laughs> no Kirsty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no you're changing you, it now. But then there's trust issues. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there uh, trust issues? isn't trust. You, know, it, you trust it, each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the biggest, uh, I guess, the, the catch-all for associated persons is what we call the tripartite test. Mm -hmm. And and basically, if, if you're associated to, to Kirsty, yeah. now you could be a trust, companies, whatever, Yeah. and then... I'm associated to Kirsty under a different associated person test, mm -hmm. and suddenly you and I are deemed to be associated persons. Uh, okay, so if you're a developer, mm -hmm. and suddenly I've become associated to you, <laughs> and we've had that association since I acquired my land, then I'm tainted for for the purpose of land tax rules. So, but it is a legislative definition, and and so I have no friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the good thing is, at least the associated person's definition for land transactions is a, is, is slightly narrow, narrower mm. than the general associated person provision. So they put some carve-outs in there. Carve -outs, so, yeah. so you may be able to get around the association for... I think they have a definition online as well. But. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, everything's searchable. <laughs> so you can either search uh, legislation.gov.nz oh, and yeah. find the Income Tax Act, or you can go online onto the... Uh, the ID website and you can probably put associated persons in there and come up with some stuff. So thanks for doing scenario three and um, it Do I think of an answer on that one? <laughs> that <one's laughs> it seems far, far more complex, it is, yes. and it's going to have a whole lot of other things involved with it we won't even touch on now. But what I'd like to do is um, say hand back to Stacey for some, some key questions, questions yeah. and maybe if Ben, if you have a look at the questions as well, because we'll see some of the ones that may be pertinent and quite relevant. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So Absolutely. if you want to pull up the question bar, cool. and um, maybe you can put them, put them to um, Richard. We do. Yeah. Um, one person asking for your contact details, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just say who you work for? I know that was said at the start. Yeah, I think, it, I think it'll be on the links anyway, but it's uh, Gilligan Shepherd. You can find me. We're in. Um, we'll, we'll include all the links yeah, in the yeah, um, show yeah. notes below later on, and Stacey yeah. would uh, have that uh, yes. for everyone as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Do you mind if I pull that forward just because my eyes are so old? And yeah, then sure. I think oh, Stacey's going to read it now. Oh. She'll stump it with the things we could um, maybe see some of the quite. Uh, yes, yeah, so he, he, here's one I would just say. Does an ex-partner count as an associated person? Wow. Well, um, That's a good question, actually. Mm. Ex-partner in terms of business or relationship? So, uh, Let's say both. <laughs> well, an ex-partner from a business perspective would no longer be a partner. Relationship. So, relationship. Yeah, so I'd say a, a relationship. Um, I'd have to look at the definition in terms of the associated persons on that. Um, mm. Because it does talk about um, my my initial thought is no, because I I recall the wording the definition is uh, persons who are in marriage civil union um, 
and maybe de facto. So I yep. think you tick all the boxes there to say, unless you're still legally married, you may have. So there's might be there yeah, might be a loophole there. There might be, loophole. <laughs> but I think yeah. I think if you have uh, clearly separated, mm. I'd certainly be arguing to the IRD that um, you shouldn't be caught. Mm. Just a quick question though, who, like do they actually go and check, like how, do we, how does this process work with associated persons? Yeah, well, well it depends on the person, yeah. you know, a lot of these things, I think the other thing I should probably quite good to stress is the IRD has a huge property compliance team, naturally because there's lots of dollars involved, yeah. and the government expects to get a return for its investment, yeah. okay? Good yeah. after you. So, and with the land, yep, and the land transfer, uh, system is obviously online, mm. and the and the revenue has just upgraded their their own IT systems. They have a very oh. smart computer system, and very basically expensive as well. Yeah, and all they have to do now is essentially uh, match up somebody who sold property within the right line period, because they'll have that data. They'll check that person's tax return to see if they've reported any land sales income, and they'll just send out a, a letter saying, "Please explain." We get these quite often mm. where they will say, we know you've sold within the bright line period, we've checked your tax return, there's no land sales income, please explain. And mm. there may be an explanation around it, mm. but that's often the first trigger point. Yeah. And it's, it's, the other thing I'd stress is, it's one thing to get good advice up front, it's another thing to get really good advice if you get an IRD inquiry. If you get, if a phone goes and it's someone from the IRD and they want to ask you questions about your land, just say, I'll get my accountant to call you. Yeah. Or I'll get someone else. It's just like a lawyer. <laughs> because it's very hard. First impressions count. I mean, it's yeah. such a catchphrase. Yeah. But before you know it, you've told the IID the wrong thing innocently. Yeah. And they'll have that on record. And then it's very that's, difficult. That's probably, human nature. It's that's why you need a tax advisor early on. But I'm going to go on to some point. particular yes. questions that's come up. Let, let um, Stacey read them out. Oh, no, we'll pick no. some of them rather, oh, okay. yeah, if that's okay. Um, because what I want to do is make sure they sure. kind of align to uh, what's going on. So here's one in particular. Um, we bought a 769 square metre, um, mm, 61, 61 built. built house um, in May 17. And they built another two-story uh, three-bed, three-bed in August 21, with uh, triple C issued without subdividing. They now have a plan to subdivide within a year, and if they sell the new dwelling, does the bright line rule apply? Is that too complicated? I just got it's just trying to read them. So they so bought the section in um, two seventeen, did they? Uh, yes, 2017. May. Yeah, 2017. So May, uh, five years ago. Yeah. And then, yep, so if you bought the if you bought the land in 2017, then for determining whether bright line applies, uh, which rules apply? So we're talking about no rules pre October 2015, a mm -hmm. two year rule, a five year rule, or a ten year rule. Yeah. The first thing you look at is what date did you sign your binding agreement to buy that piece of land? So that date on that contract matters more than the date on the settlement, correct? Correct, yep. So if you bought your land, so in this case, if we assume the contract was signed in 2017, mm -hmm. the bright line rule at that time was a two year period, okay? Yes. So, and, 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 and March, and, right? March was the cutoff. Uh, March, March 2018 18. was when it changed to five years. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Brightline cannot apply to this situation, even if you create new titles, mm -hmm. because Brightline just looks at the original lot of land. It's clear law that when you subdivide your land and you get issued with new titles, those new titles do not have a new Brightline period. It goes back, back to the original 17. lot. Yep. So in this case, 2017. So I'll be quite confident that um, that Brightline won't apply to you, but again. And I haven't quickly read through the facts. You'd be wanting to look at section CB12 because mm. you have commenced or you will commence the subdivision scheme within 10 years. You may have already commenced a development scheme, depending on what you had to do to, to your land to make it ready for purpose. Um, so that's probably where I'd be more worried about because once you trigger section CB12 um, or section CB13, mm. it then doesn't matter when you sell the land. You know, we're talking of no exclusions yeah. applied here. Once yeah. you've triggered the taxing provision, then it's taxable whenever you sell it, unless you can claim an exclusion. Even after 10 years. 
there's no 10 year rule, yeah, no which rule. a lot of people get confused about because yeah. they just say, do we just hold, have to hold yeah. it to 10 yeah. years? So, yeah. Yeah. The other one I thought that immediately was um, quite relevant was from Emmett. Uh, can you please touch on interest tax deductibility yeah. scenario? <laughs> yeah. Because um, this is with, with um, yeah, you know, a... people driving rental income. Mm. So, um, scenario to be one lot subdivided into two section sold within a few years and the existing dwelling on lot one kept until bright line period ends can i deduct interest on the existing house okay so i didn't quite take no, all that in, but, but, but essentially if i can say the basic rules with interest is that um if you had pre 27th of march 2021 interest mm -hmm. that's what we call grandparented mm -hmm. so then you're subject to a phase out yeah um till march 2025 when it will reduce to zero um if after 27th of march uh, 2021 you then add a um sorry if you add a new build to your land um after 20 and the ccc is issued after 27th of march 2020 mm -hmm. okay then that's referred to as a as a new build and then you should be able to get interest deductibility mm -hmm. for that portion of the land that contains the new build but not the old but build. not the old build mm. okay so there's apportionment issues when you so start basically that's, that's probably yeah, a whole that's answer, it's yeah. probably a whole nother yeah. webinar you could talk about yeah. Yeah. interest yeah. limitation yeah. Rules. Yeah. yeah were there any other questions one. that you spotted that would be the other two of the there are quite a few here maybe um, um stacy could yeah, stacy are there other ones that you um this one here from Emma, maybe? Sorry. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say that one from Emma. Is a, is a relocated house considered a new build? Um, yeah, I think um, as long as it's, as long as it's had, because presumably now I'm not, uh, a, uh, I haven't done any sort of land uh, deals myself, but I assume that when you um, relocate that building onto land, you still got to get issued with CCC. You're going to have following new titles on that. No, it's more the the triple C. I can't answer that. Well, I know yeah, what I would say, but be, I'm not going to say. Because that'll be basically yeah. be your answer. Because yeah. if you get if if you because you you know the whole thing about um, about the the new bright line rules reducing the five year for new boards, the interest. I thought it was new titles only. Yeah. No, it's to do with triple C. No, it's to do with a triple, triple C. C. Oh, yeah. Because the whole thing around this is about they don't want to discourage uh, increasing the rental supply. Mm. So if you say um, buy a um, a piece of bare land mm. and then you add a dwelling to the land after you buy it, it should as long as the CCC is within the right period, then you should that should qualify mm. as new build land and then subject to um, both ongoing interest deductibility oh, as as well as a five-year bright line um, yeah people are saying here yes it requires yeah. a triple c yes yeah. relocation oh, yeah, gets triple See? c that's where all these yeah. birds are yeah, out yeah. there yeah <laughs> but again this is the yes <laughs> yeah yeah cool so, was there any other questions there there are quite a few but i'm not sure i've had i've had questions yeah. asked to me about the interest deduction rules where people are just like uh mm. you know putting something in their garage or mm. you know that it's certainly not self-contained and that sort of thing and those those sort of things so basically if you get a renovation and get new cc it's a new build it's, it's got to be self-contained so if you're just going to renovate a property they're not going to you know you haven't added a new self-contained dwelling to your land so it's unlikely to satisfy a new reclared provides a triple c a new code of no code. but it's still got a it's still got a it basically increase the occupancy of your land i guess another way of putting it you've got to be adding new stock to the market and that's what the government doesn't want to discourage by then taking away your interest deductions or have so if you read your right pile your house you <laughs> <laughs> anyway let's there's another question here that's I, I hadn't um touched on it but um it may be of interest to some and that is uh, 20 hectares of farmland farmed for 40 years okay would the option be better to develop into housing um, housing self or sell the land as a whole to a third party also if that land was inherited then within a few years of getting it in will would there be implications if 
I, if it was to be developed. So farm I mean, land one. Farmland yeah. that um, 40, 20 hectares has been farmed for 40 years and are they going to, okay. are they best to sell it as a lot or to develop it? Okay, so there's, there's quite there's, a lot there's, there. there's quite a bit in there yeah. as well. Um, because a lot of, if you actually look at a lot of the tax cases on uh, both CB12 and CB13, they actually deal with farmland that's been cut up into, um, you know, into, into lots. Now here, of course, CB12 won't apply because the land's been owned for, for many years, mm, but yeah. CB13 can still potentially apply. Change your private um, use, maybe? Well, if you were going to do a, um, a significant residential development mm. and then sell a whole lot of lots, you're likely to trigger both uh, CB13 mm. because you, you, if you're looking at the exclusions that apply to section CB13, mm. clearly this farmland is not business premises as defined. Uh, to qualify for the farmland exclusion, you basically got to sell it as, a, as an economic farm that your purchase is going to carry on farming. Mm. Okay, so clearly if you're dividing it up into residential lots, that's not going to apply. Naturally, you can't claim the residential exclusion because that requires you to have less than four and a half thousand square meters of your yes. original lot. Yeah. And then the other one is your investment income exclusion. Well, you're not going to hold, assuming you're going to sell these these lots when you carve them up, then you're not going to be able to claim the investment income exclusion either. So more than likely, you're going to trigger section CB13 here, mm. unless you're not going to exceed the significant expenditure benchmark. So that's going to come down to how many lots you're going to create. Um, and can you stage it? So could road. you get away with yeah? <laughs> could you get away with selling a few before and before it becomes yeah. taxable? Yeah. Um, and again, the number of lots, even though you've owned it for so long, you're going to trigger a taxable activity for GST. I think what they're saying, what you're saying, is tax advice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we need to know why that. It's just avoiding the self promotion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Maybe we can have one more question yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, maybe Stacey, if you can read us one more question from the. Like a lucky audience. Day. Yeah, there's one here um, that will be relevant. Um, if completing a one lot subdivision off an existing site with a rental with future intention to build for a rental on the new site, is there any tax implications for just sitting on the new vacant lot for a few years before building the rental? Can you just, just go through that slowly again? Yeah. Right. So. Um, they're completing a one lot subdivision off of a con existing rental site with future okay. intention to build a rental on the new site. Um, but, okay. they, but they want to sit on that re vacant lot for a few years before building. Are there any tax implications? Yeah, so if you basically, this would be one of those scenarios where, where we go back to, you know, what is, what is your intent of doing the, the subdivision scheme in the first place? Because and the revenue says it's, you know, again, if you if you go and look at that um, uh, IS uh, 2008, I think it's covered in there. Um, it talks about that the taxing provision applies if you if the purpose of your purpose of your scheme of subdivision is to sell the land. Mm. So if you're doing a subdivision and then you're going to sit on the block and leave it as bare land, then arguably you're not doing that subdivision for the purpose of sale. Mm. Now, if I was wearing IRD's hat. I'd be saying, well, why did you do the subdivision then? Now, <laughs> now your response here may be, and again, they're always going to have the benefit of hindsight. Mm. Um, you may just be holding it as bare land because eventually you're going to have the cash flow to erect another dwelling on it mm. and then rent that dwelling out. Okay, But if you held it for a period of time, put a dwelling on it, and then sold that dwelling straight away, I think you might be in a little bit of hot water. Mm. Because you know the revenue might just say, look, we just think you held on to it for a period of time, but actually when you did the subdivision, you always knew you were going to put a, a dwelling on it and sell it. Okay, so therefore none of the exclusions to CB12. Because um, I think was this one a, a rental section or they lived on the land? Rental and both the existing yeah. and the new one are intent for rental. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you, so. You, if you if the new one's going to be rented as well, then I would be now there is a there is a little bit of noise here coming from various corners that um, the revenue may take a view that if your land is already driving residential investment and companies and you undertake a subdivision to erect a new residential dwelling which you're also going to rent out, mm. 
that um, the, the purpose of your undertaking or scheme is not to derive residential investment income from the land because you are already deriving residential investment income from, from the land. Now, I haven't had any cases challenged in that way, but I, I have heard whispers that the revenue is potentially um, taking that view. Mm. So, um, so if you're looking at that scenario, then you, you know you've got to try and look at it. Maybe a non-legislative exclusion, or yeah. you just or you just go for it. You, you just claim the if you do sell that piece of land, you claim the residential investment income exclusion. Yeah. In a way, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming on to the webinar series. Um, unfortunately, yeah. we ran out of time today. <laughs> I know there's so many more things that we would love to dwell on and obviously talk about. Tax is um, really Tax is, yeah, one of the most exciting things, you know, um, of this month. Um, but anyway, um, we will have lots of information about Richard in the show notes um, later on. And also the video will be posted uh, tomorrow. Um, so everyone that missed today's webinar will be able to view that again. And it will stay on the Subdivision New Zealand um, group form. So um, thanks for coming again, and um, we'll see you guys all next month. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.